I'm Aria Schwartz, along with my co-host, Rachel Galligan, and welcome to the Windsider Show, where it's all about the W. This episode, we are talking with defending WNBA champion coach, Mike Tebow. today to be joined by defending WNBA champion, head coach and GM of the Washington Mystics, Mike Tebow. If you like our show, please consider joining our Patreon community for less than a cup of coffee a month. You can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the W. And coach, the first question I have to ask is, have you reco- recovered from the championship? Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, it, it's, the, it's one of those things probably that you celebrate uh, over the course of time, um, we didn't have a lot of time to just dwell on that. My son got married 10 days later or nine days later, and it just seemed like we just uh, kind of celebrated for two weeks straight. So uh, that was fun. But uh, the reality of things came back uh, quickly because there was a lot to be done. We've undergone um, some changes in our organization as far as uh, better integrating the Mystics and the Wizards and uh, GoGo and our district gaming team all into one kind of umbrella and, you know, trying to do a lot of enhancements within the organization uh, for on and off the court things. So we've been busy with that. Um, so it's good. I mean, it's a, it's a good way to celebrate that uh, you keep getting better at some things. Hey, Coach, this is Rachel Galligan. So happy to have you on the show and, and congratulations on the run. We, we all enjoyed uh, watching you guys and um, we'll, we'll get into some X's and O's, O's type stuff later on. But um, obviously this is a tough week for women's basketball in general with the passing of Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gigi. And I know, you know, your experience in the basketball world is, is goes unsurmounted. And, and I just kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about this week Um you know, do you have any experiences, any thoughts? Um, obviously, Kobe was a guy that was bringing a ton of attention, a ton of attention to women's basketball, the WNBA in particular, and, and by coaching his daughter. And um, I just, you know, we felt like it was important to kind of talk to you about that and see what kind of your thoughts were on the matter. Well, first of all, I mean, uh, having been a former Laker assistant coach years ago, I know how hard uh, Laker Nation is, uh, you know, going uh, what they're going through this week. Um, you know, once you're a part of the Laker family uh, as a player and you're a star, um, the, the status that you have and the, and the connection you have to the community is huge. And we've seen that all week. I mean, from, you know, an instant memorial at Staples Center and, and all of that. But my own personal experience, you know, I've, I've kind of crossed paths um, in different ways with Kobe. I mean, I was still coaching in the NBA in Milwaukee when he first came into the league. And, you know, we saw the, the youthful Kobe and the growing process he had to go through. Um, and then when I went to the WNBA, you know, the connection wasn't the same. But, you know, I had an interesting experience uh, in 2008 at the Beijing Olympics. Uh, he was part of the, the men's team uh, there. And I was a coach for the women's team. And coincidentally, his birthday and my son's birthday are day apart. So my son turned 21 and Kobe turned 30. Um, during that time, and you know, it was kind of a fun situation where you had a, a party in the hotel uh, at night, and the chef for both teams, and you know, made a cake for the two of them, and it was, you know, that was a different kind of memory. But then most of my interactions, you know, from a distance a little bit uh, with him, have been watching him become a father uh, and, and coach his daughters, and, and and go through that process, and you know, being a part of empowering women's sports. Uh, through his daughter, you know, he was uh, a regular at Sparks games uh, several times when we played there. Uh, he was at the All-Star game that I coached this summer in Las Vegas. And, you know, it's just uh, heartbreaking to see a situation where, uh, you know, this this father who kind of got it as far as, you know, the equality between men and women in sports and, and how the world should be and view those things. 
uh, is gone from us. I mean, he he was a great beacon for the WNBA, uh, and because of his status in the basketball world, uh, he helps uh, others, you know, accept the women's game and empowers, you know, the the young women through his daughter to be to be, you know, coached well and uh, respected for what our game is. Yeah, and uh, it's it, it's a sad time not to you know move from that and just completely shift gears and, and go back to the W and to other serious topics. But uh, you guys announced, uh, I believe it was yesterday or very recently, the past few days, that Elena Deldon had a surgery. Uh, it sounds like it went well. Can you give us a little update for that? Because I know the fans are dying to know about that. Yeah, I mean it was a really simple procedure. Uh, she went to uh, Dallas for. Uh, Dr. Dossett there, who uh, has performed a lot of uh, back uh, surgeries on various athletes. And, you know, relatively, you know, people hear back injuries, they all, and back surgery, you know, the the, the red flags go up. But the, the surgery went well. It was, uh, you know, you know, some relief already uh, for Elena. Uh, basically, you had uh, a fragment of the disc pressing on a nerve. And, um it wasn't, you know, we tried the conservative approach uh, for, for the, through the early part of the off season, um, but uh, that wasn't progressing fast enough, and and it didn't. We didn't really know that it would ever completely solve the issue, and so the recommendation by several uh, physicians was to undergo this procedure, and uh, the expectation is that she can be back on the court you know, sometime between three and four months, which would put her at, you know, training camp for us and start of the season. And if all goes well, that's, you know, that's what we're looking at right now. So I know that there's, you know, a lot of people alarmed and we're in trouble, but uh, everybody here feels really good about the process so far. Well, that's very interesting. Obviously our uh, thoughts are with Elena and, and her recovery. It's, it's good to know that it's taken care of and hopefully we can see her back out on the court at the early part of the season. But Talking about EDD, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan. I, I have watched her for so many years, and she's just, uh, in my opinion, the greatest player in the world. And I have to ask you, Coach, what what is it like coaching her? Um, you know, it's a it's a coach's dream when you have a player like that. Um, you know, the way the game has progressed uh, to have a player that, um, you know, is six five can play inside, can play outside, can pass, uh, you know, is one of the best shooters in the history of the game um, and is smart uh, and loves being part of a team. You know, that, you know, one of the most underrated parts of Elena is how much of a family and team person she is and that, you know, having the right blend of players around for, you know, everybody getting along and everybody being unselfish and everybody being on the same page. Uh, that's been a big part of her. And uh, I think it was what we, she was craving when she came here. And, you know, luckily, you know, it's, it's built into that kind of a team. And uh, that, that's a big part of who she is. It's just a pleasure. I mean, I, I'm spoiled, you know, and, <laughs> on the men's side, you know, from Magic to Kareem to Michael to those kind of players to the kind of players I had in Connecticut in the WNBA and now having a group like this uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing as a coach to have players that have bought in that much. You know, coach, you talked about um, in your answer just there, you talked about how the game has progressed. Um, that's kind of something I wanted to ask you too. You know, this, this style of play, this modern era of basketball, um, your offense, we, we, we obviously saw one of the greatest offenses, if not the, the greatest offense in WNBA history. Um, I would like to ask, how did you do that? That's obviously a, po a podcast in its own that, that would last a long time. But how did you do that? And, and how do you build on that and, and make it even better? Well, the easiest way is to get the best players. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, coaches, you know, coaches are as good as their, as their players. And, you know, obviously there's things we have to do to put a system in place and, you know, figure out some of the other things as you go along. But having multi-dimensional talented players. I mean, you know, Elena couldn't win it by herself. I mean, when you have a Christy Tolliver and a Natasha Cloud and then an Emma Mieseman and an Ariel Atkins, and you can go down our list, Latoya Sanders and Ariel Powers, you have to have a lot of really good players uh, to do that. I mean, we have kind of an unsung person in a player like Tiana Hawkins, but, you know, here's another post player that can shoot the three and post up 
we we made the the conscious decision was to get as many shooters as we can uh and have them have multiple skills not a post player who was just anchored on the block uh not you know a guard who could only drive you know you just need to be able to do multiple things and the lesson we learned the year before against Seattle is you know we had a lot of really good shooters but they always had one more shooter on the court than we did and you know a lot of young coaches get all fired up and they say boy you know give me that hard nosed defensive player and I'll make him into an offensive player it's not that easy i think it's easier to go the other way around and have great offensive players that you convince to play good defense and work together uh because defense is there are some skills but there's also effort involved where there are a lot of skills involved to being a great offensive player. And I think that's much harder to do. And so, you know, it sounds like a simple answer, but over the course of the last seven years here, we've tried to keep adding efficient um, multidimensional offensive players. And that's been the biggest thing we've tried to do. So coach talking about this, <clears throat> you mentioned a lot of these uh, big name players that you guys have. And last season, I was I was honored to be at a lot of the games uh, and, and hear your press conferences and, and hear the players talk about Emma being the missing piece. Um, now, we know she's a free agent, and they're, obviously because she's a free agent, there's even maybe a sliver of a chance that she doesn't come back. Um, I know that fans she's have also... Back. Oh, she's all right. I, I love it. She's I done. love it. <laughs> Boom. Uh, we, uh, you know, she and, uh, and Elena and Christy are all free agents. Uh, that's what we've been working on this week. Um, we feel, you know, pretty positive where we are with all of them. So, um, but we've gotten, you know, uh, verbal commitments. We can't sign anybody till February 10th, but we've gotten, uh, you know, the verbals we want from Elena and Emma, and we're working on um, Christy now. So, uh, I, Emma will be back. She will play this year. That's amazing. Well, there goes there goes that question. But I, I am curious. <laughs> Talk to me about. And thank you for the transparency. But talk to me a little bit about the free agency process. Um, you guys have a star-studded roster. Um, you know, are you making a quick adjustments early on to try and repeat? Do you feel that you have the roster? I mean, what goes through your mind after a championship in the free agency process? Well, I mean, I think every organization would like to think they could add another piece or do something else to – uh, make yourself better. Defending is really hard. We haven't had a back-to-back -back champion in our league, I don't think, in 18 years. Uh, we'd like to be the first in that group. Uh, so, you know, you'd like to think you add pieces. But the reality is, um, with a salary cap and your, your best players being free agents right now, and a lot of players in the league timed up their contracts uh, so that they would be free agents this year when they knew there would be a collective bargaining agreement um, change. So um, we don't really have a ton of financial flexibility to go out and do uh, a, a big, you know, deal. Uh, it, it would require, you know, some manipulation of our roster or trades. And I'm not in the mood right now uh, to, to trade uh, what's, you know, a fairly successful formula. Um, you know, to go and get another big piece would require giving up something. And I'm not, I'm not in that mindset. Um, I think that, uh, we may make one change somewhere in there, but it will not be, you know, we're not we're not in the market for a max contract player out there. And the other fallacy that's out there a little bit, you know, the cap uh, took a 30 percent jump uh, and the max player contract took an 85 percent or 87 percent jump. Uh, is is that, you know, we're going to see a situation where, you know, most teams are going to have one or two top end contract players. Um, but the thought, you know, under the old system, I guess it's easier to explain under the old system, you had a lot of teams with, you know, the fourth or fifth best player making almost the same or the same as the best player that's going to change. And it should, the, the top, top players in the league should be paid accordingly, but it doesn't mean everybody else gets that same kind of jump. And so, you know, you, salary cap management right now is going to be a really big thing. And teams that go and overspend and get themselves caught in a tough situation for the next two years may pay the price down the road. So we're trying to be really uh, cognizant of how we balance, um, you know, what we have now versus what we're going to have to do in the future. And we have, you know, several key players that will be free agency a year from now. We have to be prepared for that. 
Now, uh, you're talking about the new CBA. Is Do you think the, the salary cap and kind of the structure of that is kind of the thing that's going to affect you as a GM and a coach the most? Or is there there's something else uh, that, that you think is, is kind of a key point? No, I think that's going to affect it a lot. I think, you know, for free agents, we've become a popular destination. People want to play with the group that we have. But the reality is you just can't go out and get everybody. Um, you know, the, the restrictions of what you have. You know, if you give um, roughly, you know, 35% or 30% of your salaries uh, to top two players, you know, now you're trying to sign, you know, nine or 10 players uh, with, you know, 70% of the rest of your cap remain. And, and so, you know, there's a reality check that's going on for players in our league right now. There are players who are going to get raises but they were kind of max contract players in the past. They aren't max contract players under the new system. They just aren't. That's part of the, that's part of it. They're going to, they're going to be making more money, but it's not going to be the jump that the superstars make. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a, that's a big consideration as a GM for me going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of you as a GM, I have to ask uh, us at Windsider, we have this ongoing joke and I think a lot of other people are in on the joke, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can do a mock draft, but Coach T is always going to mess it up with picking someone that nobody <laughs> saw going that high. Can you talk to us about your drafting strategy and what goes on to getting these picks? Because you are blowing them out of the water recently. Well, you know, no offense to the people that do mock drafts, but most of the people that do the mock drafts are not out watching film and going to gyms like coaches are, you know, and it's not just me. I'll give you two examples. I mean, I know for a fact that when we took Ariel Atkins, it was a surprise to a lot of people. I also know that the two teams picking right behind us were considering doing the same thing. The same thing mm -hmm. last year when we took Kiera Leslie, Atlanta picked right behind us. And if they were honest, they will admit that they probably were going to take her when we did, if we hadn't. So it's not like I'm the Lone Ranger. I just happened to try to figure out where a player fits compared to the other teams that have interest. Uh, the second part is I don't go around sharing my information about players. You know, the league wants the coaches in our league to, you know, to help them, you know, select who should come to the draft room. I'm not a huge participant in the sense that I will give them the obvious names, but I'm not going to alert, you know, five other teams in the league uh, by giving a name for who should be brought to the draft that maybe isn't on the lips of four or five other people or in the league office. You know, the people that do mock drafts aren't the GMs. Uh, they aren't the coaches. You know, I watch, if I'm looking at a player like Ariel Atkins a couple of years ago, I'll give you an example. I saw her play her junior year several times. I saw her play in person her senior year six times plus about five or six practices. I watched probably three or 400 clips of her uh, over the course of her two years in certain game situations on Synergy. Um, and so, you know, that process is not the same process that people do mock drafts. And then the other part of it is how do these players fit your own philosophy or the players you already have? You know, I see people who put us down for a player uh, in a mock draft at a position we don't even have a need for sometimes, you know. And, and so, you know, I get calls from agents, you know, you ought to bring this post player in, you know, they can play. And I'm saying, but whose place are they going to take on our team? You know, so when we draft, we're, we're you know, unless you're just in a situation where you take the best talent on the board, you know, we have, we have specific needs when we took those players and they fit our team and our culture. Coach, I have to tell you, you know, we've had a lot of people come on this show, players and coaches, and you, you are just spitting pure gold right now. I, I am loving everything about having you on here. I, I'm just like taking notes left and right. This is fantastic. And, and I can't wait to just have everybody listen to you. Cause you're just, you're, you're incredible to listen to, but I, I do want to ask you another hot topic, um, switching gears here a little bit, your coaching staff. Now, you obviously have this fantastic legacy, this incredible resume, everything that you have been able to accomplish in, in your career. Um, you've lost an assistant, but I, but I kind of want to switch gears to your son, Eric. He, he's one of the hottest names um, in terms of any position that was um, open this season. And I guess the first part of my question is, what is it like to work alongside your, your son? Um, and then the second part of that, you know, how do you handle the two hats of that as, as a head coach and obviously wanting him to stick around and keeping some longevity within 
your your staff and what you've been able to accomplish, but then potentially, you know, seeing him move on and take a head coaching position and, and facing him one day. Well, that's been an interesting discussion both within the organization and in my own family. I mean, first of all, the two of us haven't killed each other yet, so that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, you know, I think um, the hardest thing with working with your son is, you know, knowing uh, the difference about, you know, what's a coaching thing and, and a father-son thing. And, you know, there are days that gets tested a little bit. Um, you know, we're both really competitive, um, but – you know, he's kind of one of those basketball savants. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not trying to brag because he's my son, but he's one of those people who has got it from he, when he was really young. Um, and he just has understood the game. You know, he grew up around NBA game and then, then the WNBA game. And so I'm proud of him, what he's done. He's had, you know, a lot of interest. He turned down a job a year ago. Um, but I think, you know, long term, um, I'm not going to do this forever. And, and, you know, we're trying to set this up here that we can stay good for a long period of time. And at some point I'll probably step away from this and just be the GM and, you know, he can become the head coach and, and take over. So, you know, I think there's part of that that, you know, draws him to stay here. Uh, he just got married. His wife has a job at Georgetown here as a trainer. And so, you know, that it's a really good situation for me and for him and his family. And so, you know, I hopefully, um, you know, as much as, you know, sometimes you think maybe he ought to get away and get his own identity with our organization and our players. I, I do think he has his own identity, maybe not to the general public, but our players um, love him, love what he does. They, they know how good he is. And, you know, he's got a lot of the responsibilities already that a head coach would have, you know, as far as overseeing a lot of things that we do. And so, um, hopefully, you know, he's still young, he's 32 years old and, you know, he's going to have a long career in front of him. And, and so, uh, I, I think that it's set up the right way for him if he wants to. And if he decides at some point, you know, Hey, I want to go somewhere else and have my own identity. I'll, I'll, he'll have my blessing. Um, you know, the selfish part wants me to stay. You know, the other interesting thing about the relationship is that, you know, what's really good is that we can disagree and argue with each other. And, and we don't, you know, take it personally and let it hold over. I think it stunned my staff the first year we were here that he and I could argue uh, vehemently about some things sometimes in a closed door meeting with the staff. And, you know, some of my staff wasn't used to that kind of dynamic. And then they saw how it worked for us. And, and it's, it's fine. Final question we have, Coach, and then we will let you go. You know, a lot of people don't necessarily understand what goes on with the staff and with the head coach and the GM and your assistants. Um, what what did what do the next few months look like for you guys? Um, you know, is it obviously um, you're not just sitting there kicked up with your feet up, you know, hanging out? But but what does that look like in terms of you traveling and going around and getting on the phones? Um, just kind of give the fans a little bit of an insight as to what these next few months are leading up into training camp. Well, I appreciate that you understand that because that's one of the first questions I get from a lot of fans. Well, what do you do with all your free time now? I don't, I <laughs> haven't found any free time yet. Right, um, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, you know, after the season, when the season first ends, we kind of do a uh, let's go back and do a self check on ourselves and, and evaluate all of our season. We do exit interviews with players. Uh, we talk about things that, you know, we would like to accomplish in the off season. And then we kind of take a mental break for about a month. And then as you get toward the start of the college season, uh, we start gearing up and we'll start, you know, deciding which college players uh, we want to see in person. A bunch of them will watch on film before we decide to go out and see them, uh, get on the phone and talk to coaches. But we'll watch a lot of film early on. Now we're out seeing a lot of games and practices. All of my staff has been on the road. Um, you know, looking at, at different games, um, uh, I don't, I'm not doing as much right now as I've done. And I'll do it more as we go through conference play when you have better matchups. But, you know, back in, in the Thanksgiving and Christmas area, I got out and saw tournaments and so did my staff. Um, you know, free agency has been a part of this, you know, trying to see where we are with our roster. Uh, we'll have a staff retreat here in a couple of weeks for about two and a half days where we take a look back again. Are we on target? We look ahead towards the draft, trades, free agency, what follow-up there is, um, you know, what we need to see for conference tournaments, uh, early preparation for the draft. We'll talk about training camp, uh, what we want to do, 
What if we want to do new things? What do we want to do different? You know, what new technology do we have available to us? Uh, and, and in our situation, we're going to have some great new technology available to us uh, this year. And, and, and it'll hopefully it'll keep us at the forefront of the teams in our league. Uh, so we gain a little bit of an advantage in some things. But, you know, I go to the office almost every day. Uh, today I have, you know, a couple different meetings, one including uh, preparations for our parade in May. Um, so, you know, you have all those things. So the life, uh, life goes on on a pretty busy business. It's, it's a, it's a year round job. It's, you know, probably 11 months of work and you get a little bit of time to kind of take a break. I usually try to take a little break right after the final four or after the draft to kind of get my mind clear for four or five days. But in general, I'm kind of a workaholic when it comes to this and, you know, we're, we're, we're busy at it every day. Well, your your work ethic has clearly paid off, and we're very appreciative of you dropping all this knowledge on us and taking your time. So thank you for joining us, Coach. Appreciate it very much. Uh, look forward to all your podcasts along the way. <laughs> appreciate it. Appreciate it. Well, as we always say, we believe the players of the W and its community deserve the same in-depth analysis and respect that men's sports receive on a daily basis. With that in mind, please consider joining our Patreon community to help support us in the hard work that we do. Thank you, Coach. Have a great day. You bet. Thanks.